purpose of all goal achievement is to develop a sense of mastery, efficacy, to achieve a certain type of happiness that can only be had as a result of achieving goals. A lot of people find once they acquire the muscles they'd always dreamed of, they're not really different inside. Because they, they don't take this philosophical approach as you started this particular issue with. And I just concluded it with. Hmm. The idea is to gain a sense of mastery, a sense of self-esteem, happiness, which can only be derived from achieving goals. Huh. Yeah, that's a, that's a... But you have to have that stated explicitly at the outset. If you think that you're going to end up having those things only as a result of having the muscles, and you don't work on developing other aspects of your life along with it, like your philosophy, then you're just going to end up with a set of muscles and be bereft of the rest. Right. You and I both know there are a lot of top bodybuilders. As top bodybuilders, of course, they have the big muscles, but they're self-arrested intellectually. They're right. no further ahead at the age of 30 or 40 mentally than they were 10 or 15 years ago when they started. They're psychologically beset by the same conflicts, the same sense of insecurity, uncertainty, self-doubt. They've got the big muscles, but they didn't get that sense of mastery, self-esteem, which can only be achieved by starting the whole process by stating explicitly, not only do I want big muscles, but I want self-confidence. I can only get that by enjoying the process, gaining the knowledge, recognizing that I am a more effective person. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that, that is that, that is hitting the nail on the head. I mean, some of these guys, they you know, they don't know why they're uh, they don't know how they got to be you know uh, top pro bodybuilders. They don't know exactly you know what they're doing you know with it and uh, where they're going. And and I've met uh, you know people that were much more knowledgeable about the sport that uh, only had an average physique right. after meeting uh, a lot of, of the top physiques as well. But uh, you know, that is a great, um, great uh, little uh, uh, introduction to your, to your system. I know that one of the, the most popular questions that we get uh, here is about, you know, training. And a lot of people say, uh, I tried Mike Menser's system and I can't believe the difference that I made. Uh -huh. And so what is it that, that is different about your weight training philosophy, uh, the actual hands-on stuff in the gym, and, and maybe go back and trace, is this something that you've used all of your career, or did you try all different styles and finally discover this? I, like most bodybuilders, tried a variety of things. I, like most bodybuilders, approached the subject, I'm sorry, let me back up a second. I, like the vast majority of bodybuilders, Bill, made the mistake of approaching the subject of training on the implicit assumption that all training theories had some merit. Then I wasted precious, precious time frantically trying one after the other in the hope that someday, somehow, some way I'd find something that works. I see bodybuilders doing it today, and again I say it's a mistake. Bill, it could not possibly be true that all, or even many, or even two training theories had equal merit or were, were of equal validity. There is and can be only one valid scientific theory of anything. For example, there's only one valid science of mathematics, medicine, astronomy, ethics, electronics. Likewise, there is and can be only one valid scientific theory of exercise. And it just so happens to be, as I learned 20 years ago, the theory of high intensity training. Prior to that time, I was training up to three hours a day, six days a week, making little or no meaningful progress. I had finally reached a point where I was about to forsake my bodybuilding goals. I couldn't justify spending four hours a day in the gym I was already working 12 hours a day in the Air Force, working a part-time job, trying to see my girlfriend as much as I could. 
I just couldn't justify spending one more hour a day in the gym. At that time, I was fortunate to make the acquaintance of Arthur Jones, who, during a lengthy phone conversation, explained to me in the most scrupulously objective language imaginable the theory of high-intensity training. I recognized almost immediately that it was true, that I was not the expert on the subject I had thought I was. In fact, I came to realize I knew almost literally nothing of value about the subject of exercise. Muscle magazines, I came to understand, are not sacred scripture. They're not even science journals. And even if they were, you've got to read science journals critically, too. Exactly. Muscle magazines take articles from almost anybody. As a result, a lot of the information is contradictory. This is why most bodybuilders are agonizingly confused, painfully bewildered. Well, one month they tell us this in one magazine, the next month in the same magazine, or even the same month in a different article, they tell us something different. By the way, the, the first chapter of my new revised heavy-duty book is entitled Bodybuilders Are Confused. Every day of the year, Bill, seven days a week, I get phone calls from bodybuilders all over the world. The most their most salient characteristic is what I just described. They're confused, agonizingly slow, agonizingly so. The muscle magazines, for instance, tell people that all bodybuilders are different, they all re that we all require different training programs. Then they go on to contradict themselves by suggesting everybody do 12 to 20 sets. Well, I thought we're all different. If we're all different, then why in the hell is everybody doing the same damn thing? Mm -hmm. In fact, it is true, of course, we're all different in that each of us has a unique personality. More important in this context, anatomically and physiologically, we're all essentially the same, which is what makes it possible for me to state with such certainty that there is and can be only one valid scientific theory of training. When a person goes to medical school to study that particular science, medicine, they study the basic principles of physiology, which are universal. They apply to everybody. If everyone's cells, muscles, and organs were constituted and functioned differently, we'd all be unique physiological entities unto ourselves. And doctors couldn't make diagnoses, perform surgeries, or dispense medicines. It's this fact. The fact that we're all essentially the same anatomically and physiologically that makes it possible for medical science to exist at all as a viable discipline. Now, the science of exercise, the science of productive bodybuilding exercise, like the science of medicine, is based on the principles of human physiology also. The fact that the basic principles of human physiology are universal, again, is what makes it possible for me to state that there is only one valid theory of training, i.e., one best way to train. It is not my mere opinion that every human being requires intense training to stimulate optimal increases in strength and size. It's a well-established fact beyond debate. Nobody would argue that aerobics is the best way to build muscle. They may not understand it explicitly, but they recognize or sense on some level that the reason for this is that aerobics is too low in intensity to stimulate an optimal increase in strength and size, or any increase in strength or size. It is a well-established fact beyond debate that high-intensity training is an absolute requirement for stimulating increases in strength and size. That's the first principle of the theory of high-intensity training. And because high-intensity training is very, very demanding on the body's limited recovery ability, it follows logically that such training must be brief and infrequent to allow for the production of an increase in strength and size. That's the second part of the theory. In order to allow the body to produce the increase that was stimulated as a result of the training, the workouts have to be brief and infrequent. In other words, bodybuilding is not aerobics. 
this is the hard part. This is the hard part for most people. Most bodybuilders would find it quite easy to accept the first principle that you've got to train to failure. That the training has to be very intense. The hard part is in accepting the second two principles, namely that exercise has to be brief and infrequent. They all have in their subconscious the idea that more is better, which is actually an, an ethical economic principle. More money, more pretty girls, more success, i.e. more values are better than less. You can't take a principle from economics or ethics and apply it to body.